So towering over me here is my biggest scope. It's also the scope that I've had the longest. I've had this thing now for a near 25 years and it's starting to show its age a little bit, but still, this is actually a great option for astrophotography. And I think that the Newtonian in particular is rather underserved, if you will. Like people don't give it as much credit as I think as it deserves. And in this video, I'm going to kind of tell you some of the pros as well as some of the cons and address those cons to using a Newtonian for astrophotography. Now, this scope is has come a long ways from where it originally started. It's, it's actually not really a astrophotography minded scope. It's designed for visual use. However, I have very heavily modified this thing in order to make it suitable for astrophotography. And even visually, uh, I think there, were, there was actual visual improvements. The contrast levels went up quite a bit when I made all of my improvements. So what those improvements were is number one, I swapped out the focuser because the original focuser is a hunk of junk. And in doing that, the newer focuser actually was a little bit longer. I couldn't get it to go in as further, far enough to actually reach focus. So what I had to do is I had to actually take this tube and cut it. I basically cut about three quarters of an inch off of the, the back end here and then move the mirror in further and that basically allowed me to get focused. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, wouldn't that change the optics? No, it doesn't because the Newtonian, the secondary mirror is just a straight flat piece of glass and changing the distance between the main mirror and the secondary isn't going to change anything in your optics. Really, the only thing that determines the focal length of your scope is the shape of the primary mirror, all right? So that's how I was able to basically shorten the tube in order to still reach focus with a new focuser, which was a lot higher quality focuser. Now, another thing that I did to it was I actually cut out baffle rings and I taped them to the inside using felt tape. I'll show you. All right, so I'm gonna to attempt to show you, if you will, basically the knife edge baffles. There's actually one right up front here, and then there's about a total of 32 of them that go all the way down the tube. And what they are is, is they're actually made of black paper, which I cut on a laser. And when I cut them, I actually made them a little bit smaller than the primary mirror. And there was a reason for this. This was one of the very first production runs of the scope. And the very first production run had the edge of the mirror was a little bit rounded off. And what that did is when you took a star and you took it way out of focus, it had some weird aberrations around the edges of stars. And by basically reducing the aperture by about an eighth of an inch, which didn't cost me a lot of light gathering power, I was able to take care of that aberration. Now, more modern scopes, of course, are not gonna have this problem. Like I said, it was only the first production batch of these eight inch F5 Newtonians that came out from Orion that, that had this problem. So that about sums up all the different changes I made to it. Of course, I did get one of these this is actually meant for a Schmidt Casey Grand, but I use it on the Newtonian basically to keep dew off of the secondary. And yeah, that's about all of my uh, upgrades that I've done to it. Now, let's talk about why I like Newtonians. Number one, they're big light buckets and they're very affordable. Number two, uh, well, they're big. <laughs> okay, if you have aperture fever, and if you want fast optics, these Newtonians are great. Now mine's actually an F5, which is kind of slow. Uh, most of your imaging Newtonians are gonna be in the F4 range, which is quite fast. Now really they kind of act like F4.5 and that's because of the central obstruction of the secondary mirror, uh, which is not something to really worry about too much. But you know, yeah. And, and one of the reasons why I like the F5 Newtonian over an F4 is that it's a little bit easier to collimate and also the secondary mirror is smaller, which means that I get a little bit more contrast in my images. Now, let's start talking about some of the cons that people list. There's really only two, okay? So, number one, 
collimation. You have to collimate these things. And people find this to be some massive hurdle that's hard to get over with. I don't know why, because it's actually very easy to do, okay? So the people that say stay away from Newtonium because of collimation, uh, uh, there's three camps, okay? Number one, usually they're people that aren't very mechanical. They don't know which end of a screwdriver to hold. I know that kind of sounds rude a little bit, but I mean, really, you look, let's call a cat a cat here. If you're not mechanical, then maybe you don't want to get into a Newtonian, you know. But if you are a mechanical person, which most people should be mechanical, and if you're getting into the astrophotography hobby, you should be a mechanical person. If you're not, you should learn, okay, because uh, you've got to be a mechanical person in order to, or at least mechanically inclined, in order to be able to work on these things, to build your rig, and to be successful in astrophotography. So, mechanical. The second one is, there. some people are just overly perfectionistic about their collimation. In other words, they just freak out if their stars are just ever so slightly off. And, those people will sit there and they'll collimate and they'll collimate and they'll come back sometimes several times during the night and re-collimate again. Don't listen to those guys. Really, if you get your image, if you get your Newtonian 99% collimated, just be happy with it. <laughs> Don't overstress about perfecting your collimation because you'll just get yourself discouraged. And that's one of the number one reasons why people complain about collimating their scopes is that they're they're trying to get to a level of collimation that is unachievable or that you shouldn't really bother and nobody is going to notice in your images okay and no one's going to look at your pictures and say oh well, you're 0.3% out of collimation there okay you know get yourself 99% collimated and just call it good so yeah overly perfectionistic those, those are the second group of people now, the third group of people are just people who are working off of off-dated information, okay? Older Newtonians were difficult to collimate, especially the ones that with really long tubes because you had to come up, look at your collimation, then go back behind the thing and make some turns, come back. And it was about a laborsome process. Uh, with these new short, fast focal ratio Newtonians, you can basically reach while holding, while looking through the optical system to see your collimation and just start tuning it which makes doing it very easy. And the knobs on today's Newtonians are mechanically much better than they were 20 plus years ago. So yeah, most of the people who, who complain and that are in this category, they're thinking about scopes that were made by hand probably 20 or 30 years ago, and they were, they were just harder to collimate. Today's scopes are just really easy to collimate. I know, and especially, if your scope doesn't come with these, well, a lot of scopes today do, they come with little knobs up here, which means that you can collimate the secondary toolless. And by the way, the secondary mirror is the mirror that you're going to be collimating the most. It's the one that will get knocked off the most easily. And it's really the easiest one to collimate, okay? So don't be afraid if somebody is telling you to not get a Newtonian because, you know, well, 30 years ago they had a Newtonian and it frustrated them. Today's Newtonians are much better than they were 30 years ago. Now, the last reason that, or the second reason that people, you know, kind of go after Newtonians and they say not to get them is because of the diffraction spikes in the stars that are caused by the little veins that hold the secondary mirror. And if you ask me, this is a little bit of a silly reason. And once again, this is also one of those things that's kind of, it's, it's outdated information. Now I have on here, this is a 1600 mm pro. The 1600 mm pro produced rather large stars. And because it produced large stars, it also produced very large diffraction spikes. Now, if you have a 294mm or a 2600mm or a 533mm, those newer cameras produce much smaller stars, which means that they also produce much smaller diffraction spikes. So, in my opinion, if diffraction spikes bother you, you know, just think about this, you know, they're much smaller in today's modern sensors. And, and a lot of people think them to be 
very natural looking. You know, there are people who even put artificial uh, diffraction spikes on their stars so to kind of dress them up because people, when they look at stars, they assume that they should have diffraction spikes on them because all the pictures of Hubble that they've seen have diffraction spikes, okay? And I know the James Webb has a really weird looking diffraction pattern, which is a little bit obnoxious if you ask me, but people are okay with that too. And, and if diffraction spikes really do bother you that much, guess what? You can 3D print little brackets that go on your veins that will actually eliminate those diffraction spikes. So, you know, once again, you know, this is a problem for which there is a solution, you know, so. Overall, I mean, I love my Newtonian. Mine's getting kind of old. I'm kind of thinking about maybe upgrading here eventually to maybe one that's a little bit faster, but we'll see. All right, so one thing I'll interject in here, how often I myself find myself collimating my Newtonian. Not very often, actually. It's about every six months if I don't jostle it around too much. Uh, if I do kind of find myself bumping it and moving a little towards, or if I take it in a vehicle some, to somewhere else, well, then I'll have to recolonate it again. You know, if you are one of those people who drives to a location to do your astrophotography, then you're going to have to collimate, which, once again, my experience has been pretty much that <laughs> The only thing that needs to be adjusted is usually the secondary. In fact, I took that thing to Cherry Springs, which was a three and a half hour drive, down some very bumpy roads, I might add, and the only thing I had to move was the secondary. The primary actually stayed right in place, uh, which is a testament to more modern scopes. Uh, the newer scopes stay collimated much better than the older scopes did from 30 plus years ago, which is, is once again one of the reasons why I say like it's, it's old thinking a lot of times, you know, people think, you know, oh, well, I had a scope 30 years ago that was terrible nightmare to collimate or keep collimated. And that's just because mechanically those scopes sucked. Okay. The newer ones are just better. <laughs> okay. So yeah, but every six months I kind of touch up the collimation of my scope and that's about how often I do it. I do not go out multiple times during the night and recollimate. If you're doing that, there's something wrong with your scope or you are just, you're being too anal <laughs> with your collimation. So let me give you just an overall rundown of my particular rig, should you wanna copy a setup like this. I've got an AM5 in the bottom, which is just barely adequate to carry this amount of weight. And these are two and a half kilogram weights, there's two of them on there. So tiny little bit over the limit of this bar, but I've got them mounted further up, so not a problem. Now, using, this is the ASI Air, this is the version 3.3, which is the fastest one. I've got a 1600 mm Pro and then a five position filter wheel. I only use this rig for narrow band imaging. So it's got a bunch of bodder, two and a half inch, uh, I think six and a half and seven nanometer filters. I'm sorry, eight and a half and seven nanometer filters. This is my Telrad, which is just kind of on here. If you don't have a Telrad, these things are awesome, okay? They're old as the hells, but they work great. And then, uh, what is this? This is a 120mm planet guide camera. And then I have on here, this is a 70mm Astromania scope. This is a 400mm focal length, which is plenty for guiding a focal length like this. The focal length of this scope is 1,000mm. Of course, it's f4.9, but really it's about f5 now that I kind of reduced the aperture slightly. And yeah, as you can see, I've got all my wiring and cabling all pretty much under control. I use these little black adhesive clips to keep the wires down, which is nice. Uh, there is only a dew heater on my guide scope. That's it. I don't have any dew heater on the secondary or the primary simply because it's so far back in this tube. I've, I've never had a problem with dew on this thing. Now, the back side of this, oh, there's one more thing. The back, I actually, covered the back end with felt and that was because I found that any stray light from like neighbors lights or something like that even though I'm out in the country I've got neighbors who have lights they're several hundred yards away but this does affect my images uh, light will actually pass through the back of the mirror and kind of spoil the image a little bit and so I actually covered the back side with felt paper and then of course, here I got my power and USB coming up to the main scope. 
and then everything of course is powered and routed to the ASI Air Plus. And yeah, that's pretty much my setup. It's a good one, I really like it, and I just kinda, I wish this thing was a little bit lighter, but you know, that's what it is. But though, for an eight inch aperture, this isn't a huge amount of weight, okay? If you were to have an eight inch, uh, let's say, refractor, okay, that would be a monster, and it would certainly weigh a lot more than this guy would. And, and by the way, you can actually get Newtonians with carbon fiber tubes, so they're even lighter. Uh, so yeah, you, you have options out there as far as weight goes with these things. Now, when I do my rotations, typically I do not rotate the camera. Instead, what I do is I loosen these and I actually rotate the optical tube. That way I don't need to do calibration frames over again, you know, and that kind of saves things. Now you'll notice I do have the camera mounted pointing down majority of the time. And the reason for that is to get weight closer to the central axis of rotation here on the mount. And what that does is it kind of takes a little bit of strain off the scope. So don't put your, your camera out here to the side if you can avoid that. Because having it out the side, of course, then means you have all these balancing issues that you have to work out. <laughs> all right. So there you go. Newtonians, I think they're great for astrophotography. If you want big aperture, look into one of these. It's a good way to get yourself a large aperture. Now, there is another type of scope out there called the RC or the Ritchie Creighton. And those are great scopes too. I've used them. I actually think they're easier to collimate than a Newtonian. With a Newtonian, you have 10 axes of, rota of uh, rotation that you need to take care of in order to get the thing completely collimated. Whereas with a Ritchie RC, you only have eight. And so it's a little bit easier to do. And uh, I've done one a couple times. We have a 10 inch at the observatory that I'm a member of. And I've certainly found it easy enough to collimate. Uh, I found older members come in and they collimate it their way and then it's out of collimation and their images suck. But you know, it's <laughs> and I have to come back and I have to re-collimate it, which doesn't take long. It's really easy to do. I don't understand why some people uh, just find collimation difficult because it's, it's not, all right. And yeah, that's pretty much my, my ode to the Newtonian refractor for astrophotography. All right, I almost forgot to talk about this. Pretty much every Newtonian is going to need what's called a coma corrector. And a coma corrector works a little bit like a focal reducer, uh, only it doesn't reduce the focal length at all. You actually can get a few coma correctors that will reduce focal length a little bit. A lot of the newer Imaging Newtonians that are specifically designed for astroimaging actually come with coma correctors built into them, which is kind of a nice plus. Uh, this one here that I have, this is a Botter uh, Generation 3 2 inch coma corrector. Uh, it basically fits into this thing like an eyepiece, and essentially that's what I would screw my filters to if I was using like a 2 inch filter, uh, but I use a filter wheel, of course. And like any other focal reducer or field flattener, it requires 55 milliliters of back focus. So you just figure the back focus just like you would any other refractor. 